Danielle Farrar, and if anyone knows. Um, you guys know as much as I do about who they are. I don't see too much need to give you a lengthy introduction. If you guys feel the need, you can give yourself a biography. Otherwise, let's see if we just get started. So, um, I'm Jesus Charlington. Um, first off, I would like to apologize for all the possible hosts that there will be at the end of the presentation. What you'll see is a condensed four-page version of what is so far a 30-page manuscript. So, if you have any questions at the end, you are more than welcome to ask them. Um, now, what you see behind me are photographs of Las Vegas, Nevada. A vibrant city full of neon lights, and if you get the reference, you'll get five points. Rooms full of smoke where women come and go talking with Michelangelo. Um, Vegas is a city that I learned last night through a good company that excites the imagination of those who visit, and in the world of fallout, and perhaps in our future, Vegas looks like this. When Fallout 3 was to be released on 2008, Bethesda, that's the publisher, advertised the game using a poster that depicted Washington, D.C. in ruins. These posters seemed to make individuals nervous, and after several complaints, Bethesda decided to remove the posters. There were various reasons as to why people, were, um, as to why people asked for the Fallout 3 advertisements to be removed. One of the reasons given was that even though political speech and art was protected under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, video rooms were at the time not art. Therefore, the use of controversial and potentially offensive images in their advertising campaigns should not have been allowed. Now, had the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on whether video games had achieved art status and obtained the protections of the First Amendment before 2008, this would have been a non-issue. However, even though video games have had literary and artistic qualities for a long time, it was only last year that the Supreme Court of the United States granted video games the official status of art. Certainly, when future complaints of this kind are made, this will not be an issue that can be exploited not that it ever should have been in the first place. Still, while the constitutionality of games might have been the key reason for taking down the advertisements from a legal perspective, there was another more powerful reason given as to why the fallout posters should have been taken down. And it is a reason that speaks volumes about the society in which we live. In a letter to sorry in a letter to the editor published on October 5, 2008, in the Washington Post, a DC resident by the name of Joseph wrote that, and I quote, the people of our city do not need a daily reminder of, uh, what, of that Washington is a prime target for an attack. We do not need a daily reminder of what our worst fears look like, end of quote. In short, Joseph was afraid of the potential future depicted in the fallout as advertisements. And the key term is fear. Throughout history, literature has reflected not only the values of a society, but also the concerns and fears of the society that created the literature. This is evident when we look at Blake's writings on the French Revolution, Emerson's comments on how American literature should be traditionally American in nature, Arnold's writings on religious concerns in the light of Darwin's theory of evolution, and the many war poets of the 20th century. Yet, if we are to apply the same rule to our current society, while defining the term literary in its traditional definition, then one would have to say that we are concerned with or afraid of magical children and sparkly vampires. However, the idea that only words on printed text are literary has been challenged throughout the past decade. And even now, scholars and writers like Janet Murray and just my Owens comment about the literary and artistic qualities of video games. And so, with more Americans playing video games than reading books, and with these media being equally valid as artistic forms of expression, it might be worthwhile to think about how values and concerns are represented in the living text. In this paper, I will explore how Fallout 3 and New Vegas the paved our native collective fears and how the medium's ability for interactivity 
actively empower players to cope with these concerns while making the claim that uh, titles are some of the most significant cultural works of this generation, at least uh, digital cultural works of this generation. And this brings us to the fear of fallout. The science fiction narrative of fallout is set in a retro-futuristic, unknown yet familiar post-nuclear world. The fallout timeline is fairly consistent with that of our own reality until the post-Second World War era, where different outcomes to major political events shift the world in a different direction. In 1970, China fails to adopt any free market reforms and remains similar to what it was under the Mao regime. In 1991, Soviet Russia did not collapse. These two events strained relationships between the communist nations and the United States and led to a perpetual Cold War. By 2059, oil resources become increasingly scarce and the United States decides to drill in the Alaskan oil fields. In 2066, China, with her oil reserves um, exhausted, invades Alaska. Between 2072 and 2076, the United States works on annexing Canada, and by 2077, America reclaims Alaska. And then, on October 23, 2077, nuclear bombs are launched by the United States and China. According to the lore of the fallout world, and I quote, who struck first is unknown. Other countries, seeing the missiles on their way, launched their planes and fired their warheads as well, end quote. The American people um, in the fallout world, having been bombarded with fear propaganda during the previous century, neglect to heed the warnings of the oncoming attack and failed to find safe shelter. The effects of this result in a world um, that's horrible and in which the player is set loose 200 years after. Although Fallout 3 is set in Washington, D.C., and New Vegas is set in this city, Las Vegas, Nevada, and the basic story told in each game is slightly different from each other, the games themselves share a similar theme that can be unlocked by looking at the world and its inhabitants. Um, it is through this world and through the behavior of the non-playable characters that the Fallout titles allow the players to confront some of their fears, namely the fear of a nuclear attack and the fear of a decayed state of humanity. When players are first faced with the rules of Fallout 3 in New Vegas, they become overwhelmed with a sense of uncanny. Players who are familiar with what Washington DC and Vegas should look like are quick to experience that instant where the game world is simultaneously familiar yet foreign. This, was, this results in a feeling of uncomfortable familiarity. Um, this is heightened by the player's ability to put together the narrative of the game uh, and wonder what if. Um, it's actually from the internet where people have wondered what if we get attacked in our city. Um, just as the advertisement had a discomforting effect on the population of BC, so do the games, which force players to come to terms with a possible reality where one must and I quote, kill and steal to make a living and where most of the food is radiated and a potential future where one must eat to survive but the act of eating itself results in a low, painful death, end quote. The fear of a possible post-nuclear world becomes more intense when the player finally interacts with the citizens of Fallout. In this world, the remaining humans try to organize themselves based on their recollections of capitalist society. However, due to the lack of organized societal structures, the survivalistic nature of individuals surface. This results in an anarchistic world guided by a crude version of Herbert Spencer's survival of the fittest, where the strongest groups survive and the weak are quickly discarded. This is especially true in New Vegas. By forcing players early on to seek out and join one of the many, many warm factions, and by taking away the player's ability to lead the world into a happy, peaceful ending, I quote, Bethesda completely wipes away the idea that somehow a great disaster will bring out the nobility in humans, that there is always hope for humanity, that essentially we are all decent beings, and quote, that's from Michael Sinden. Um, in short, the Fallout titles tell players that in a post-nuclear world, there is no hope for revival of humanity, 
because each individual is focused on self-preservation. And so, what was originally fear of a potential future and fear of a dehumanized society becomes fear of self. Fallout titles do not force players to traverse the story in a linear path where the same outcome is inevitable in every, in every playthrough. Fallout is as much a spatial narrative as it is a story-driven narrative. Because of the <coughs> openness of the world, players are afforded a higher level of agency over their characters than in other texts, print or otherwise. The game offers players a level of freedom to the point where they can actively make choices that affect in-game characters and the world itself. The fallout of these choices range from potentially harming an individual to detonating a bomb in one of the few safe cities in post-apocalyptic deceit, or of allowing an army to overrun the biggest strip. The heightened sense of control coupled with visible measurable reactions of the game flow to the player's choices force players to think before they act, to consider different possibilities, and perhaps most importantly, to discover themselves based on the actions they make in-game. The follow-up titles force players who are invested in the characters they have created to ask themselves, how far would I or my character go to survive and come out on top? The first time players are faced with this question in Fallout 3 is when they reach the town of Megaton. In the center of town, there is a still active bomb that is worshipped by the children of Adam, a religious group. Um, when they enter the city, players are approached by a character called Jericho, who asks them to deactivate the bomb. Successful completion of this quest will give the player 100 caps, that's the in-game currency. However, the player also has the choice of blowing up the city, which has the potential of earning the player up to 1,000 caps. Here, players are forced to ask themselves if they, are, if they are willing to destroy an entire city for a substantially higher reward, or if they made what would be considered a good choice in a world where morality, not profit, and self-presentation were the norm. Similar situations are scattered, scattered throughout the world of Fallout 3. In the quest title, Superhuman Gambit, players are asked to dispose of two individuals who are fighting against each other. Um, here players are forced to ask if they are willing to kill an individual for 200 caps, both individuals for 400 caps, or if they should turn down the quest. In the Tempain Tires quest, the players can choose to help a number of disfranchised goals that seen as who suffer from radiation poisoning enter the safety of the tower, where they will likely kill the owner and many of the residents of the tower. Players are also given the choice of killing the disfranchised goals. There is a higher road that players can take um, if they have a high enough speech skill in the game, which will result in the goals and humans coexisting in the tower. But the conditions required for this option are rarely achieved. If the owner of the tower is dead when the player starts, starts this quest, they will have to convince Gustavo, that's the leader of the Tenpen militia, to let the goals in. However, this option is not programmed into the game, so the players will be forced to kill this tower to proceed with this quest. Players will also have to follow this by making residents of the tower um, go against each other. For example, Michelle Wellington, a player will have to make her kill her husband, Edgar, and her husband's lo lover, Susan, and make two store owners leave the tower by stealing from them. This raises questions of morality in the player and the player's reflection of the character. And so this leaves the question and answer, would I and would my character be willing to do this? Would we be willing to die for this end? In New Vegas, the scenario becomes more complicated because players are forced to join factions and create reputations from the early moments of the game. The question evolves from would I and would my character be able to kill someone under these circumstances to would I and my character be able to kill someone to build reputation within the group. Unlike Fallout 3, which has a limited number of outcomes, the ending sequences in New Vegas are determined by the player's actions. Should players decide to help defend the town of Good Springs and gain a good reputation with the citizens, or should players decide to join the invaders and gain access to their weapons. 
Um, every active choice players make inevitably leads them down a path where either the new California Republic will take over Vegas, and this and that lovely side California, Ron Nevada. Um, an army by the name of, uh, or have an army by the name of Caesar's Legion enslaved Vegas, or perhaps where Vegas becomes an independent power, either under the rule of a despot, Mr. House, or under the direction of an artificial intelligence called the yes man Depending on the quest taken by the player, the outcome might be one where the player that the player was not looking forward to. Um, in my first playthrough, for example, I wanted to side with the National California Republic. And instead, I ended up giving the power of Vegas to the artificial intelligence because the New California Republic didn't want me and I didn't like any of the other factions. Um, this made me realize that the mechanics of New Vegas are similar to those that govern life in the sense that the things that we think we want might just not turn out in the way that we expect them to. In the end, it's easy to interpret Fallout 3 and New Vegas as protest and warning against nuclear warfare. The dark world and the darker behavior of the characters that inhabit it tell a story of longing for what, for what was and certainly serve to warn players of a dark possible future. However, because of the mechanics of the game, which force which, which force players to engage with the game world in ways that they might not normally want, the Fallout titles give players valuable lessons about themselves. Throughout Fallout, people like Joseph will be, that's the guy who wrote the letter to the Washington Post, will be able to face their fears and embark on a journey of self-discovery that has the potential of making individuals question their own self, sense of self. And in the end of it all, they might even walk away with the lesson that war, war never changes. See if we can hold all our questions to the end, because I think